I imagine you've made some pretty good friends there, too. Why don't you tell me about them? Yes, I have made a couple of good new friends. Mike Wiley is a wonderful, wonderful uh, staff uh, staff member. He does a great job making um, frappes. He does a great job calling orders. And then there's Miss Lauren Moore, who works on Tuesday. She and me like to crack jokes together. She loves making frappes, and I love hanging out with her every Tuesday. And then I love working with Miss Kelly and Maddie, uh, Maddie Ashcraft. I love working with my two managers. They're such a joy to work with. And Mr. Trevor Jefferson, he's really fun to work with. I work with him on Mondays, and I like to call him Mr. King of Dance because he loves to dance on Mondays. <laughs> I would love to see him dance. <laughs> oh, he's quite the dancer. He loves to cut a rug with, on the dance floor with all his customers. That's 27-year-old Matt Dean talking about Biddy and Bo's, the coffee shop where he works in his hometown of Wilmington, North Carolina. Matt's official title is Director of First Impressions, and he's one of 40 employees at Biddy and Bose with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, or IDD. Today we'll hear the story of Biddy and Bose and meet the incredible family at the heart of it with their own deep and personal connection to its cause. This is Crazy Good Turns. We tell inspiring stories about people who do amazing things for others, and I'm your host, Brad Shaw. Amy and Ben Wright met when they were students and aspiring actors at the Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. But interestingly, their paths had previously crossed. Amy was in the audience when the teenage Ben played Jack in the Broadway musical Into the Woods, and they both rode on floats in the same Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Did you actually get to meet him when you saw him on Broadway and in the Macy's Parade, or were you just two ships passing in the night? We were ships passing in the night, and the funny thing is, when I saw him in Into the Woods, I was sitting in the back row of the balcony, and I literally fell asleep during the second act of the show. <laughs> so he likes to give me a hard time for that. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't know him. And um, and I'm a big fan of Into the Woods. But at, at that time, I think sitting in the back row of the balcony was, was uh, not the best place for me. Anyway, yeah, it's just kind of crazy that uh, that our lives did intersect like that twice. And, um, and then it wasn't until he came to the Conservatory of Music that we actually started having you know, a conversation. And um, and it really was love at first sight. He'll say that I played it cool and didn't let him think that for a second. But, um, you know, the moment I saw him, something clicked. That was September 1992. Ben proposed to Amy three months later on New Year's Eve. They married the following May. Ben did some acting and singing after college, but eventually chose a career in investment banking. Amy ran a performing arts studio for kids for a few years before becoming a full-time mom to their first two daughters, Lily and Emma Grace. It was the birth of Bo, their third child, that completely changed their lives. So when I was pregnant with Bo, there was some routine tests that were offered to me that was an AFP screening that's done at, I gosh, I think about 16 weeks. And I didn't really think much of, how, you know, the doctor recommended it. I didn't think much of it. It was just a routine blood test. But when those test results came back, it showed that there was an escalated risk that Bo, the child I was carrying, might have Down syndrome. We knew there was an elevated risk, but it didn't matter to us one way or another. So, you know, we we went ahead with the pregnancy and, and we watched him, you know, for, gosh, um, you know, children with Down syndrome, 50% of them can have heart defects. There are other kinds of digestive issues that might come up. So so we watched throughout the pregnancy and, and really didn't feel like there were any other markers or indicators that he was going to have Down syndrome. And, and quite honestly, we kind of... Ben and Amy away. tucked away any lingering concern and moved through the pregnancy hoping for the best. And then he was born and it was very... Uh, apparent that every doctor and nurse in the operating room, and I had had a C-section, swarmed him, swarmed me to kind of analyze him. And it, it's it's really kind of a sad thing because instead of experiencing the joy of, of welcoming my son, our first son into the world, we were dealing with all this speculation and and questions. And I remember nurses saying, well, it, I don't think he has Down syndrome. It doesn't look like he has Down syndrome. And, you know, there is no definitive way to say he do, does or doesn't unless you do a karyotype test. So we spent about three days 
I believe it was a long weekend, a very long weekend looking back on it, waiting for this karyotype test to come back and just kind of reading and digesting the possibility that he might have Down syndrome. We were at home and I remember the phone rang. We were at home with Bo and the doctor said the karyotype test to come back and he had Down syndrome. I still get affected by it when I talk about it because when I think back to how sad we were in that moment and how crushed we felt and how we were just scared. We didn't know what that meant. We we had never spent time with people with Down syndrome. We just, we were ignorant. Amy says she feels embarrassed now to think back about those first emotions and the sense of grief they felt over the son they thought they were going to have. But then a switch flipped in their thinking. And then all of a sudden, it was just pure light and joy and realizing that we had been trusted with one of God's most precious gifts. And and we embraced Bo. And from that point on, we were determined to, you know, make his life wonderful and learn as much as we could about Down syndrome and share our lives with others so that no parent would ever again feel the way we did in that moment when we were so scared. As is often the case with children with Down syndrome, Bo had other complications. Ben noticed that Bo's eyes, at just three weeks, were cloudy and not refracting light in photos. They took him to an eye doctor friend who diagnosed Bo with cataracts. It took several surgeries to remove them, and afterward, Bo needed glasses, but he wouldn't keep them on his face. We did contact lenses which was, you know, the only way he was going to see. And I remember the first day that it was time to put in the contacts. You know, the doctor had done it in the office, and we thought, oh, yeah, we can do that. Ben's done contact lenses before. And I remember that first day, Ben was all ready to go to work, and I was in the nursery holding Bo, and Ben came in, and he said, okay, it's time to put the contact lenses in. And I'm not kidding, eight hours later, we got the first contact lens in. It was that hard. Bo is 13 now, and despite the other issues he's faced growing up, Amy says she never could have predicted the life he's had. He didn't walk independently until he was three years old. He walked with braces on his legs and a little walker that helped him balance. But man, he was so proud of himself for doing that. And and I remember the day, it was Mother's Day, that he took his first couple of steps independently. And I still get choked up thinking about that because I do remember when he was born, some of those first thoughts that went through my head were, will he ever walk? Will he ever talk? Will he ever drive a car? Will he get married? Will he go to college? All those things that, you know, expectations you have for your child And then you throw on that Down syndrome, not knowing anything about Down syndrome, you get really scared that maybe your son will never get to experience those things. Clearly, Bo has blown every expectation we ever had out of the water because today, you know, he is... He can run and jump and swim and and um, throw a football and shoot a basketball. And he has more friends than I do. He's very social. He does very well in school. He can read books. He can do math. And he's he's just oozes with personality and charisma. And um, and you know, I just remember when he was a baby, wondering what his life would be like. And boy, did I, I had no idea it would be so wonderful. She also couldn't have predicted the impact that raising Bo has had on her personally. I feel like I really didn't start living until until Bo came along because when you have a child with disabilities, every little moment counts. And you start seeing the world through their eyes and what seems so important to us typically developing people and the way we are moving so fast through the world fades away. And, and you become so appreciative of the little moments in life. And it may be laying in the driveway, looking at the clouds roll by, or, you know, learning after 45 minutes of how to pull a zipper up or push a button through the buttonhole. It's those little victories that just remind you of how, how special life is and how you should never take the moments for granted. Five years after Bo's birth, Amy and Ben became pregnant with the couple's fourth child and faced another complication. Ten weeks into the pregnancy, their baby girl was diagnosed with a cystic hygroma growing on her spine. 
basically a fluid-filled sac that um, the lymph system isn't working properly, and so the fluid starts building up in the baby's body. And the doctors watched, I mean, we were having ultrasounds every week, I believe, maybe even more frequently, and the doctors watched, and they said, you know, this child has about a 25% chance of making it to term. Most of these pregnancies result in, in loss. We just, we have some prayer warrior friends and family, and we just believed the best. And we watched week after week, we watched the cystic hygroma dissolve and and got to the point where it, it was completely gone. So when they when they did the AFP screening on her or were concerned about any chromosomal abnormalities, we could have cared less. The cystic hygroma had miraculously disappeared, but Amy and Ben were about to get some more news. So I remember the day that the doctor called just to, this was before she was born, this was, you know, at 16 weeks or something, and said, you know, we've got the AFP test back, and again, it looks like she has Down syndrome, just like Bo. And it wasn't definitive, but I I knew it. I knew in my heart, and I knew... um, I just, I remember crying my eyes out. Ben wasn't home. Uh, I called and interrupted a meeting he was in. He cried on the other line of the phone, but it was such tears of joy because we were so excited that Bo was going to have a little sister with Down syndrome and that we were going to have the blessing of being parents again to another child with Down syndrome. So, you know, we just, when she was born and we had the official karyotype test, it was, it was like, no big deal. Yeah. She's got Down syndrome. We got this. <laughs> so uh, very different experience. Again, just why we share our story so openly because, you know, we have that unique perspective and, and want other parents to know that there's nothing to be scared of. Amy and Ben named their new baby girl Jane Adeline after her two grandmothers. Jane Adeline stuck for a very short amount of time, and then one day somebody called her Biddy, some, one of my daughters, I can't even remember, and it stuck. Um, she is Itty Biddy. She's eight, almost eight years old, and she looks like she might be five years old. She's just very petite. It's very rare for a family to have two children with Down syndrome. In fact, Amy says her chances of having another child with Down syndrome were no higher than someone who hasn't had a child with it. And I mean, there aren't even statistics on it. We we have connected with maybe one or two families in the whole world that have had this unique blessing, which is, you know, we always say we won the lottery twice because it just doesn't happen very often. Based on their rare experience having two children with Down syndrome and the joy that experience brought them, Amy and Ben became vocal advocates for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As Amy says, they lived out loud, telling their story to everyone around them in hopes of helping remove the stigmas and stereotypes associated with Down syndrome. They were looking for a way to kick their efforts up a notch when an idea came to Amy, the way many big ideas do. And it hit me. I was taking a shower one day, and the idea literally hit me. And I thought, there's nothing quite like a coffee shop for bringing people together. And I think... It will give, you know, we're trying to solve an unemployment problem for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There's a statistic that nearly 80% of them are unemployed, which is, I think, just an embarrassment to our country. But, you know, so so a coffee shop, okay, that could fix, that could make a dent in that. It could also bring people together. I'll tell you, I didn't know anything about coffee shops. <laughs> I've never run a retail or a restaurant or anything like that. But I felt like this is the exact way to do it. And so I jumped in. I remember running out of the bathroom and saying to Ben, I've got this idea. It's a coffee shop. I think we should go for it. And I think he thought I was crazy at the moment because (laughs) it just kind of hit me and I laid it on him. And gosh, within- That was November 2015. Within two days, she had a lease on a 500 square foot spot at a busy intersection in Wilmington. She scoured the internet to learn everything she could about running a coffee shop and got good advice from some friends who owned a coffee roasting company. Finding potential employees with IDD wasn't hard. I just took to social media and just put it out there just on my own Facebook page. And I said, you know, here's an idea I have. If you want to learn more and you want to be a part of it, come to this meeting and I'll tell you what I'm thinking. And I didn't have all the answers at that point, but I did have about 100 people show up that wanted jobs it was hard not to be able to hire everybody. We, we started with 19 employees. They opened Biddy and Bo's Coffee a couple months later. It was an instant hit with lines of customers winding around the corner. But success brought its own challenges. 
we were on top of each other and we had we couldn't cool the place down and we couldn't stock enough stuff. I would have to make grocery store runs every morning because we didn't have a refrigerator big enough to store the amount of milk that we needed on a weekly basis. You know, it was just it was very grassroots when we started. Luckily, six months later, a customer who owned a car dealership with an empty 5,000-square-foot building offered it to Biddy and Bose, and they moved right in. Today, Biddy and Bose employs 40 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They range in age from 18 to 60. For many, it's their first job. I mean, they they really almost feel like celebrities because people do come in um, after having seen them on social media or something and and know a little bit about them and want to get a picture with them. So you're not just talking about what's it feel like to have a job, but it's like, what's it feel like to to be respected like that and admired? What are the long-term benefits that come to your workers from that fulfillment and satisfaction that comes from working? Well, I like to say what happens at the coffee shop doesn't stay at the coffee shop because I think when they leave their job, they have a new sense of identity, new sense of confidence that they carry with them out into the world. And so for someone like Matt Dean, who has never had a job where he interacted with the public before. Before Matt landed his gig at Biddy and Bowes, he mostly did behind the scenes manual labor. He worked in a warehouse for a while and in the storage room of a drugstore. When Amy sent out her Facebook post looking for her first employees, Matt's mom suggested he apply. But Matt wanted nothing to do with it, mainly because he was shy around people. He didn't think he'd be comfortable interacting directly with customers. So she dragged him kicking and screaming to the meeting. (laughs) I tell you, he was one of the last people to leave the meeting. I could tell that night he just was so interested in what we were doing and was warming up to me. And he, he laughs about it now because, you know, he said he didn't want this job. But as soon as he got it, he saw how transformative it's been for his life. I am the director at First Impressions. I basically say hey to all the customers, make sure uh, make sure to take their orders, make sure to see if they need any refills on drinks, and make sure that um, they have the best customer satisfaction. I enjoy making new friends at Being and Bays, and I enjoy seeing the, um, the great smiles that everyone comes in when they leave. Amy says that working at Biddy and Bows has changed Matt's life. I mean, he's a perfect example of giving somebody a chance, seeing them blossom. And then with Matt, I mean, now he's greeting people at church. He goes to bowling with um, some of his friends every week, and he's like the life of the party, you know. But I'm not sure he had the confidence to do all those things outside of work before he had the experience at Biddy and Bo's Coffee. What is the most fun thing about working at Biddy and Bo's? I enjoy the customer experience. I love seeing new customers. I enjoy seeing even some repeat customers. Mike Ashcraft is one of my regular customers, and he's a great man. He's so um, he's so much fun to be around, and he um, and it's easy taking his order and remembering it. And Miss Kathy Ranger is a fun customer to be around too. I've known her since I was little, and she's been like a best friend to me too. And it's been awesome uh, seeing customers I know and even newer customers that I don't even know and becoming good buddies with them. Amy and Ben say their mission with Biddy and Bose has evolved. They're not simply offering employment opportunities for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They're also advocating more broadly to prospective employers about the benefits of hiring people with IDD. I think a lot of people might have ideas that when you hire somebody with an intellectual or developmental disability that you're going to have to deal with all these challenges and how are you going to train them and how are you going to supervise them. And I would just encourage everyone to abandon that and and know that everybody has gifts and talents that they bring to the job. And it's a matter of somebody, a business owner, maybe thinking a little bit outside the box and going, gosh, you know, maybe we could tap into those skills and let them shine here in this work environment because there's so many benefits to having somebody with a an intellectual or developmental disability in, in the workplace that um, you may not even realize. And, and kind of back to just perspective, you know, the, the, the perspective that somebody with IDD brings to the workforce where they're abandoning an, an agenda, they don't have a big agenda about them. They're just living in the moment and they're spreading a lot of joy in the workplace by doing that. 
is intangible. As the Biddy and Bo story has picked up steam, Amy and Ben have been flooded with more than a thousand inquiries from people wanting to open a franchise. They briefly toyed with the idea of franchising, but instead decided to focus on more organic growth. So they're opening a second Biddy and Bo's in Charleston, South Carolina this fall, and are hoping to open in other cities. And how do you feel when you walk in that door every morning? Uh, I, you know, people say to me, do you go to work every day? And the answer is no, but I wish I could. Um, you know, I have other other things with the kids that sometimes pull me away. But the reality is I love being at Biddy and Bo's Coffee. I love being there as much as any guest that comes through the doors there. It is such a um, happy place to be. And and I love I love watching the little accomplishments, the little victories that happen. They make me smile. I mean, we smile every day. It's just I walk in and it's like no matter who's working, somebody rushes me from behind the counter and comes over and gives me a big hug like they haven't seen me in a year and I may have seen them the day before. And then they help me with my bag or whatever box I'm carrying. They are just so genuinely kind and helpful. There's nothing quite like it. I mean, it's a very positive and and loving environment. I'm Brad Shaw, and thanks for listening to this episode of Crazy Good Turns. Go to crazygoodturns.org to learn more about Biddy and Bose or donate to its nonprofit parent, Able to Work. You can also submit your ideas for extraordinary people or organizations we should feature. And stay connected with us between episodes by following us on Facebook and Twitter. This season, we're excited to announce that we're giving a $50,000 grant to the nonprofit that does the most to creatively spread their Crazy Good Turn story, a virtuous and self-reinforcing circle of gratitude. We'll announce the grant recipient at the end of this season. Crazy Good Turns is audio engineered by Stephen Keith. Music supervision and mixing by Scorescore in Los Angeles. Research and editing by Martine Chossard. And a special thanks to Megan Basinger. You don't get this at most jobs, but when she comes in right through those doors, all those employees at um, at that um, at Benny and Bose stop what they're doing and go hug their most favorite boss in the world.